Hi, and welcome to my talk. So today we're going to talk about graph database integration using GraphQL. But first I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and why I'm giving this talk. So you can find me on GitHub or Twitter at N3Integration. Um, my name is Rob Perry and uh, I've been writing software over the last 20 or so years. Um, and I've written uh, large-scale applications, thick clients, um, just lots of different systems over the years. I uh, interface with a lot of different databases, first starting out with um, file system type databases, uh, search indices using um, NoSQL databases, and uh, more recently graph databases. So today we're going to talk about graphs and first I thought it would be beneficial to kind of describe what a graph is. So according to Wikipedia, a graph is a structure amounting to a set of objects in which some pairs of the objects are in some sense related. Um, and this is easiest displayed through an image. So in this particular example we have uh, numbers that represent the vertices and then we have lines that connect each one of the numbers. Um, as edges that show how you can reverse from one node in the graph to the other. So we're talking about graphs, so let's talk about GraphQL, the graph query language. Um, it's meant to be a replacement for traditional web services. It's, um, it's replacing uh, RESTful APIs. Um, and it kind of gives you more flexibility in how you, you query your data set. So if you think about a traditional RESTful API, uh, you say, you know, give me some list of some object and, and uh, that service is kind enough to send you back everything, but maybe you don't want everything. Maybe you just want identifiers or the name of some field or something like that, or you want just the relationship of uh, some object or the name of the relationship. So uh, in traditional RESTful API, you can't get that flexibility, but GraphQL kind of enables that flexibility and it's kind of um, implicit in the way that GraphQL works. It's not, uh, it's not custom, it's just, it's, it's how it's defined, how APIs are defined, and it kind of allows you to um, evolve things over time uh, much simpler than using a RESTful API. So let's talk about dgraph. dgraph is an open source distributed transactional database um, and dgraph is a database that chose to use GraphQL as the query language um, which is different than some of the other graph databases out there so uh, some of the graph Languages that I'm familiar with are Sparkle and Gremlin. So uh, dgraph kind of diverged from the other set of graph databases by using GraphQL. So as far as I know, they're the only graph databases that use GraphQL um, as the, the native language. But, uh, and you know, they, they feel like that meant uh, that was a, an important deci decision for them uh, because GraphQL seemed to be a good language to interact with a graph. It just felt natural for them. Um, so let's talk about the architecture. So dgraph is composed into three different systems. So at the top here, we have the Rattle UI, uh, which is a web user interface that you run in your browser. We have the alpha servers, and the alpha servers are responsible for storing the data. And um, most of your interaction with uh, dgraph would probably be over the alpha servers. If you're hitting the servers directly for queries, mutations, or through the web user interface, uh, most of those queries come in through the, uh, or all of those queries come in through the alphas. And then finally, we have the zeros down at the bottom. So the zero is responsible for cluster coordination uh, membership. And uh, so basically back channel type operations. Um, and normally you wouldn't interface with the zero. Uh, because this is a distributed system, it's displayed as um, an odd number of hosts here. So we have five alphas, uh, three zeros, um, 
four group consensus. But if you didn't want to have a true HA distributed system, um, a simple architecture could be deployed where you just have one zero and one alpha node and then um, a rattle node as well if, if you want to use their user interface. So let's talk about the data set. So in this case, um, I found a data set on Carnegie Mellon. Um, a user has a, a fairly decent size uh, data set of uh, the set list for every concert that a band, the Grateful Dead, um, played from 1970 or 72 to 1975, I mean 1995, sorry. Um, and it basically has like the venue that they played at, the location. Um, so we've got the set list, uh, which is has a date associated with it. Each set or concert was located at a venue. So we have an outgoing edge there. Um, and then a venue is located in some location. So you can think of the location as city, state, country, um, that level of information. And then finally, uh, each set list has a set of songs and a song is either represented as an, um, a song that they played as part of the encore or just a traditional song that they played as uh, part of their set list. So how do we get data into DGraphs? So um, the way to get in uh, is to use the RDF uh, NQuad syntax, which is a text-based format. So in this particular example, if I break it down, we have a subject wrapped in angle brackets, uh, which is has the user, uh, the UID. We have the song also indicated in uh, angle brackets, which is the predicate. And then finally, we have the object, which is wrapped in quotes followed by a dot delimiter. So the dot is required to end the RDF end quad line. Um, and then in addition, if you wanted to create an RDF end quad edge, the syntax is very similar. You have subject again in angle brackets, the predicate in angle brackets, and then the difference between an edge and a traditional triple is that you have uh, the edge also annotated in the angle brackets followed by the dot symbol or period. So maybe there are some cases where the triple isn't enough um, and you wanna store additional metadata about some relationship, right? So um, what DGraph provides out of the box is they have this concept of um, a facet. So facets are um, it's additional metadata about some edge relationship. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and facets are indicated or annotated through parentheses. So in this case, we have um, circa equals 1970. And basically anything within the parentheses is a facet that you apply onto um, this triple. So DGraph provides uh, rich schemas. So they have a few basic data types, um, bool, date time, float, int, string, geo, and then a UID. Um, here I've kind of showed the predicates and then the types. So predicate is your lowest level um, schema element. You think of it like a column in a relational database. Um, and then you have a type, which is similar to a table within a relational database, uh, where you have one, one name and then you have a set of values associated with that. Um, but the predicate kind of determines whether or not it's a, a reference or it's an actual element of a, a type or a table, I suppose. So the way that they support geo is through geojson. So I included this 
screenshot of the geojson.org website. So if you're not familiar with geojson, uh, you can go check this website out. And uh, this kind of shows you what the, the JSON format is if you want to ingest uh, geodata into dgraph. So let's talk a little bit about schema indices. So as I showed on the previous, uh, a few slides back, you probably saw these annotations, add ups or add index, add count, add reverse. So let's kind of walk through what these things are. So the add up cert is a enhancement to transaction support to manage conflicts. So if there are multiple uh, concurrent requests coming in and they try to manipulate the same value, it kind of does that handling for you. Um, the index uh, annotation is basically, it allows you to expose your, your fields over as search criteria. If you don't index it, you cannot include it as a search criteria or a filter, um, but you can return the data. You just can't search by it. Um, so if we wanted to index date time, there is the, the level of granularity goes from year to month to day to hour. Um, and then if you have a string, you can index by exact, which is what it sounds like. Um, it'll basically take the string as it is. Uh, you, and that's the way it's indexed. So when you query it, it's exactly the way you, uh, you entered it. Um, hash is uh, not a cryptographic hash, but a uh, uses a separate faster hashing algorithm. Um, and it'll hash the value that you specify. And then again, assuming case and, and everything else is the same, uh, that's the way the data is indexed. In the term case, so term, it kind of functions as, um, if you think about a search index like Lucene or Elasticsearch, Solar, or one of the other search indices, um, term query is, uh, it, it uses like a, It, it does some level of normalization, right? So it'll convert values to lowercase. It'll strip out um, non, uh, non alphanumeric characters um, and just kind of like give you the, the basic forms, which is useful if you're doing um, case insensitive queries, things like that. Uh, additionally, there's full text. So if you're doing a full text search, uh, you're just inserting um, large uh, blobs of text, then full text would probably be beneficial for you. Um, and then finally in the list, we have trigrams. And trigrams are useful if you're going to, you're planning to support any kind of regular expressions against uh, some field. Um, and some of these you can use together, but uh, some, of these, some of them don't make sense to use together. So for example, you can use term and trigram uh, hash and trigram, exact trigram, full text and trigram, but you wouldn't do hash and term or hash and exact. Uh, and I believe that uh, dgraph gives you a warning um, to tell you that you shouldn't do that or they prevent you from doing that one or the other. Um, so those are the basic types, but if you have an edge type, a UID, uh, you can have a you can specify the add count um, annotation and what that'll do is it'll create an index uh, for counting the edge references so if you wanted to get counts frequently on uh, some edge then you'd want to use you want to take advantage of that um, because the counts are pre-calculated um, and they don't have to get calculated on the fly um, additionally there's the at reverse which will manage bidirectional uh, relationships between nodes and um, if you noticed on a couple slides back that's used pretty heavily so it kind of gives you that ability to kind of pivot in and out of um, the different uh, data types and kind of traverse the graph in, in either direction which I find to be super helpful um, and then last but not least um, dgraph also provides the ability to create custom index tokenizers. So the DGRAM project itself is written in Go. So if you want to write a custom index tokenizer, 
it should also be written in Go. Um, and then this is their interface. It's very simple. Um, so it just has a name string um, identifier byte, the type string, and then the last method there, tokens. Um, that's what actually does the magic, right? So uh, it does the tokenization of uh, some data. So some reasons you might want a custom index tokenizer, say for example, you wanted IP address and you didn't want it to be treated as a string or you had an FQDN and you didn't want it to be, you wanted it to be handled a little bit differently, right? So you wanted to have additional optimizations and uh, different customizations and you can write your own tokenizer. Um, and then as you start up the alpha nodes, you can pass in the tokenizers that you've written. Uh, so it basically uses uh, the built-in Go plugin support uh, so you create a, depending on which operating system you're running on, you create a shared object or a DLL, um, and then you pass that into the, um, the runtime when you boot it up. So I thought that it might be beneficial to use the REST API because it's a language um, agnostic interface into DGraph. So uh, if I walk through this, um, I've defined a, a function in Python upload schema. Um, I've defined a content type application RDF. So using the, the dgraph.schema file that I showed a, a few slides back, it reads that and then it does a post request to the slash alter um, endpoint. Um, and then it passes the schema as the body. It just re reads the response back and then looks for the data message that came back from the, uh, the server, um, if all went well and you got a 200. Otherwise, it'll display the uh, status code if it errors out. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about the, the data type query functions. So um, if you have a string, the different functions that you have available are all of text, any of text. So uh, these are useful if you're using full text um, search index. All of terms, any of terms, those are useful if you're writing your own custom tokenizer or if you have a, um, you're using the term index. Uh, then finally there's match and regexp. So match is a uh, fuzzy match um, that uses Levenstein uh, distance where you pass in the number of characters that uh, you can kind of substitute based on the fuzziness of the, the search. And regular expression, um, you just pass in a regular expression, um, assuming that you have at least three characters, because again, the way that dgraph supports regular expressions is through trigrams. If you try to pass in a regular expression with like dot star a or something along those lines, then it's going to complain and tell you that um, that, that regular expression is inefficient and it's not going to find any matches, but uh, you'll find out pretty quick that it doesn't work. Um, so then if we think of numeric and date time functions, then we have uh, comparisons for less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal, and again, these things are, uh, you can apply these to strings as well. And then finally, there's equality, which you can use for booleans, numeric date time, as well as strings. And last but not least, uh, if you have geodata, there are specific geo functions near, within, contains, and intersects. And again, these are using geo, geojson uh, format for uh, geo support. So some other query functions. So if you want to do things like aggregation, you can get averages, counts, min, max, sum. Um, some other functions are the UID function, the type function if you're looking for a specific um, schema type and you just want to query based on some type. Uh, the has function is if you want to query based on the presence of a uh, predicate. Uh, group by is pretty standard. Um, it works in the way that it would with a relational database. Uh, val is basically a function that you need if you're um, you're creating variables and you need to 
um, display that value or make use of that value, which I'll display a little bit down the a few slides up. So what does a DGRAPH query look like? So if we start here and we look at this example, so we start with set list and date. So using the type function, what this says is search by the node type set list. Um, and then right below that we have date. Um, so then we also want to traverse to the, the venue. Uh, once we get into the venue, we want to traverse to the location and then we'll pop back up to the set list and we'll traverse to the song relationship through both played song and played encore and that's basically what this example is showing there so some additional query functionality that dgraph supports um, over its language of graphql plus minus is they support variables which here we've defined as a, a variable type set list, and we've defined the variable name v1 as uid, um, where the variable name is on the left-hand side, and then as the right-hand side is the name of whichever field you're pulling out of uh, that particular object. So uid is the, the field that you get for free, which is basically uh, its primary identifier. Um, so in addition to that, you also get sorting. So you use order uh, ascending or order descending. And then you pass in the field name that you want to sort by. In addition to that, you can paginate through the data using the keywords first and offset. So in this case, we want to pull out the first 10 at the offset zero. If you want to keep paginating through, you just keep bumping up those by uh, some value, some incrementing number. Um, I also thought it would be uh, beneficial to show again the language agnostic uh, interface with GraphQL or through dgraph where we post through the REST API. So you pass in the content type application GraphQL plus minus, uh, hit the slash query endpoint and in this case, it takes a timeout um, using a duration. In this case, it's 20 seconds. Um, debug equals true, which generates some additional data on the back end. Um, and then the RO is read only equals true. And then BE is best effort equals true. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, again, the same as the previous one, check for the status code um, and then pull out the, uh, the data elements that are coming back or display the error message that was returned. So based on the data set that we have, these are some questions that we might wanna ask. And uh, I recorded a, uh, a demo earlier and um, I can kind of walk through each of these queries. All right, so the first one is uh, we're looking for concerts that included the song Me and My Uncle. So we're creating a variable. Uh, we're doing a quality function on the song. Uh, we're traversing up to the set list through the played song predicate. And then we're storing that variable V1, um, the UID into V1. We're passing that into the root function um, where we're looking for the date or the venue. And these are the results. Next, we're looking for songs that were performed at the Civic Center. So again, we have a variable defined looking for um, the terms and the location. In this case, it's Providence. Um, we're pivoting out to the is located in, uh, which will get us to the venue. We take that variable, pass it into the next function. Um, and then because we're looking for the outgoing edges, or the incoming edges of at venue, uh, we can pivot up to the set list and we can pass it into the root function. Um, and we can order by date here. 
So if we wanted to get the top end songs, in this case five, we'll do a query by the type song, um, and then we'll get the, the play count uh, by doing a count on all uh, inbound edges to that song from a set list, and we'll pass that into the root function. Uh, we'll order descending by the play count, and then we want the first five. So for the next one, we want to show the top five encores. So again, we do a query type by song. Um, we store the variable v1 for the UID, and we do a query against the count of inbound edges to the song. And then if we're doing a query for the top five venues, again, query by type venue, um, we get concerts, we do the count, we look, uh, we look at the inbound edges, um, we pass that in again, the same as the previous two examples. If we're looking for all songs performed in Boston in 1994, um, then we would look for all terms location Boston. Uh, we would pivot out to is located in, uh, which would give us the venue, pass that into the next function, and then we look for um, the outgoing edge uh, or the incoming edge, the venue, which would be the set list, and then we filter by dates greater than or equal to 1984, and then we pass that variable v2 into the root function, and then we pull out all the songs that were played um, for each matching result. And finally, if we're doing a query on international locations, we can do a regular expression query. Um, in this case, I've used comma space X to indicate that it's going to be a international destination. Um, we can pivot out to is located in to get us the venue, um, pivot out from the venue to the set list, um, pivot out from the set list and go right back in. Um, because we want to, we're interested in the location. And in this case, we re-alias the location as name in this particular example. Um, and that's stored in the variable uh, v3. That's it for the demo. So next I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, mutation support within dgraph. So again, another example using their RESTful interface, um, uh, using uh, Python as a language. Um, so in this case, we build up the mutation and we pass in the RDF. So again, the RDF uh, that we're expecting here is the NQUAD format uh, that was documented a couple slides back. Um, and then we have a set function. So in this case, if you're passing a mutation, you can use the keyword set, uh, which will do a uh, an insert or an update, um, or you can do a, well, no, it would be an insert. Um, you can do a deletion, uh, or if you wanted to, you can do an upsert statement. So in this case, it's not demonstrating that, but if you had an upsert, um, then you have curly brace, then you have set, um, or no, then you have query, you issue a query, you save those th those results in different variables, and then you use those variable names in your set um, blocks. Um, and then that's how you'd issue upsert statements. Um, but again, <clears throat> So we hit the slash mutate endpoint, uh, commit now equals true, assuming that there's uh, saying that we want this to be an atomic commit, uh, one transaction. Um, and then we're looking at the status code, checking that the data message that comes back. And then if it fails, we just display the status code there. 
Um, and then, you know, one question that may come up is, uh, how do you actually load the data up front? So, um, DGraph gives you, they give you three different ways to get data into the system. So initially you need to load the data through the bulk loader. Uh, bulk loader is a binary uh, that you run on the DGraph zero um, before your alpha nodes are brought online. And uh, the input format for that is, um, again, it's going to be the RDF format or JSON. Um, but again, like if you use the RDF format, it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to troubleshoot, debug, um, as well as generate. Um, but uh, your mileage may vary. But um, so the bulk loader uses a map reduce process um, and they give you several different knobs that you can kind of turn uh, to kind of tune the performance. They give you the number like for example, you can choose a number of reducers. So if you wanted to take the data and you want to shard it across multiple nodes, you perfectly have the capability to do that. You just pass the number of reducers that you want um, and that'll tell you how many different shards that you're going to create. Uh, you can define the number of mappers. The only caveat that I could tell you at this point is that uh, the bulk load process is not distributed. It runs on a single node. So generally, if you have uh, large amounts of data, you'd want to run that on like a, um, a, a system that has lots of uh, CPU and lots of memory, um, especially if you're loading data, data volumes in the, in the billions, right? Billions of nodes, billions of edges, or tens of billions, hundreds of billions. Um, definitely throw a compute at it. Uh, once you get the data, uh, your DGraph database up and running, uh, you can run the live loader in addition to the mutations that I showed previously. So again, uh, the DGraph team, they ship the, um, the Docker containers or the binary. It comes with a, um, the live loader uh, binary um, that you can run. So it does a lot of uh, optimizations in, in running against the uh, the alpha nodes on the same host. Um, but uh, that's all I've got. And definitely appreciate you coming to, to hear me uh, speak about DGraph. You know, definitely um, reach out if you have any questions. You know, you can hit me up on, uh, on Twitter or, um, yeah. Definitely appreciate your time. Thank you.